in the Civil War, hand-to-hand -hand combat is quite rare, let alone a straight-up sort of uh, wrestling melee that's going on in the rain. It, it just it struck me as a little bit much. I'm Gary Edelman. I'm the chief historian at the American Battlefield Trust and uh, as a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg. I give tours at more than 50 battlefields. Today, we're going to be looking at American Civil War battles in movies and judging how real they are. Right away, what stands out is the Gatling gun. The Gatling gun was around during the Civil War, but it was not used in 1862. It was also not used in New Mexico, um, where this is really set. You can count on two hands the number of Gatling guns that were actually uh, used in the Civil War. And those used would have been barely at Petersburg and occasionally on Union naval uh, vessels. The idea that these positions are prepared in a battle that in reality happened with nobody expecting it. Well, they've got revetted walls and mortar guns and all this. That stood out right away as something a little crazy. Ah! It's pretty realistic in that scene that you see a lot of artillery fire. Not exactly the artillery fire I would expect. Uh, they certainly weren't lugging those heavy mortar guns with high arches all the way through the New Mexico desert in order to get to this place. But it's pretty realistic that they're shooting with artillery at first because they're really outside of the 250 yard, 350 yard range that is the uh, effective range of the shoulder carried rifled muskets. The idea of both sides charging pell-mell <laughs> as a melee into one another. There weren't 800 soldiers on each side at the Battle of Glorieta Pass going over a 300 yard um, sort of meeting in the middle. That sounds more like uh, medieval days than the Civil War. We actually have solid accounts of how Civil War soldiers wired bridges. This was often done by engineer soldiers, soldiers who understood explosives and where to place them so that they could use as little as possible to get the job done there. They seem to be doing a pretty good job in the movie, wiring it along where the piers and the main supports were in order to make this particular bridge collapse. I'm not aware of soldiers on either side blowing up bridges during the Battle of Glorieta Pass to effect some sort of a victory. Battles were often fought over transportation facilities. It was so important to control rivers and roads and railroads that bridges were natural targets of both armies during the Civil War. I would give this clip a two out of 10. The fact is that this is so wrong that it's hard to attribute to any one battle in this campaign. this battle of Ellisville, sort of. I would call it more of a skirmish. Here you have a substantial number of people in a rural county sort of rising up to secede from the South to rejoin the Union and capturing a county seat in the meantime. That's what we're seeing in this scene. We do have examples of women joining Union regiments, sometimes dressed as men, sometimes just going into camp to be with their husbands, sometimes actually getting into battle, you know, as female combatants. Both sides used whatever they could given the time and the materials they had. Sometimes it was simple as using a picket fence. So an overturned wagon, that must have been a great way to stop some particular bullets. And if you had time to deal with sandbags and digging up earthworks, all the better. Cannons are designed to fire particular types of ordnance. It might be solid, it might explode in the air when it hits the ground in front of you, or it might shoot something like grape shot or canister. And maybe lacking all that, that's what they're showing in the movie is that in this battle or skirmish, they put metal rods into their cannon and when you blow off a cannon, it'll push out whatever is in there. And at that range that they show in the scene, those metal rods could have been devastating to man and beast. I'm not sure if they could have exactly blown up the enemy ammunition chest that they are apparently showing. I would rate this a seven. Ready, 
I've been to Port Hudson several times and anybody who both goes there and sees the photographs uh, from this place during and after the siege is impressed with the extensive nature of the Confederate fortifications. It's a very difficult place to try to conquer. I would disagree about the terrain they used for the attack because it's basically in a swamp. It's just absolutely even nastier terrain than you see there. Soldiers were starting to not only realize that if you could put some dirt just two feet thick and maybe a few feet tall, um, that you're going to preserve life. To that, why not revet that dirt with logs? Why not put a head log on top so you could shoot under that and have your head protected while you shot? While you're at it, why don't you put pointy logs out as freestanding obstacles out in front of your line? Soldiers absolutely used what we call club muskets, using their musket as a club. First of all, if an enemy's coming at you and you don't have time to take out your bayonet, affix it to the front, and then thrust it at them, you're simply gonna club that particular musket. I love that moment where there's a soldier who is actually using his bayonet um, against one of the other soldiers, and then he turns around and a soldier in the back hands him a preloaded gun. It's all but impossible to load a gun with the bayonet on the end. So that soldier would have already shot his bullet, then put the bayonet on there, and confronted by a new enemy that the guy behind him couldn't shoot at, he simply handed that rifle forward. During the Civil War, sometimes the best shooters were up front and they had loaders behind them. In the Battle of Fredericksburg, soldiers would have guns lined up next to them preloaded that they could just pop off against their enemies. Will Smith's character is an amalgamation of a black soldier named Gordon who self-emancipates and this other uh, soldier named Whip Peter. And it is a true story. I would rate this clip a six out of 10. The stakes are high at the Battle of Antietam. For the South, they're coming off of a string of victories. It's possible that if they win again, maybe the European powers will start recognizing the Confederacy. For the North, they're on the losing streak. They really need to turn back Robert E. Lee's powerful Confederate army while they have the chance and give Abraham Lincoln the opportunity to issue his Emancipation Proclamation, changing, changing the purpose and direction of the war. Artillerists, to be sure, were cognizant of the horror that tree limbs raining down onto troops could cause among the morale and the health of the troops attacking them. So absolutely, they would sometimes shoot into the trees with that deliberate idea of wounding and demoralizing the enemy. The most seasoned commanders are going to try to get their troops as close to the enemy as possible before returning fire, closing up their line and shrinking their line so that they continue to be shoulder to shoulder amidst the chaos of a battle and wait until you got to the enemy to deliver a killing blow. In an infantry line, everybody has to be a righty because if you shoot in two ranks, you've got two heads in front of you. And if you're right behind somebody, if you're a righty, you're gonna shoot between the two heads in front of you. If you're a lefty, that gun's gonna go straight into the head of the person in front of you and butt up against the gun to the person to your right. And the other thing you needed was a trigger finger and you needed two front teeth in order to tear off the cartridge to pour the powder into your gun. Night fighting in the Civil War is a pretty rare thing. The whole tactical setup of the Civil War is to be able to see things, to be able to see your enemy, for your troops to be able to see your flag. It was hard to issue bugle commands among the din of battle. So line of sight was very important, but they fought at night when they needed to. And some of the Battle of Fort Wagner was indeed fought in the evening. And, and if I'm an attacking force, I would love to have as Colonel Shaw says, we will advance under cover of darkness. <laughs> That's exactly what I would do. In the Battle of Fort Wagner, you have the most notable 
combat with black soldiers up to that time. The 54th Massachusetts made it into Fort Wagner, but as many Civil War soldiers found out, getting into a place and holding and controlling a place are two very different things. I'm going to rate them a nine. This one brought in a lot of the elements you needed to understand the scene, to show what combat was like in the Civil War. Is it perfect? No. Is it perfect enough? Yes. There is a battle called the Battle of Jenkins Ferry in Arkansas. It was fought in the rain in a, in a field that had begun to flood. And if you're planning to attack that enemy and maybe you are met with a freak, ridiculously heavy rainstorm, maybe it's to your advantage to attack them that way. Uh, maybe they're not using guns because you can't use a gun when your powder is all wet. I don't think I've heard of an account of somebody actually grabbing the bayonet. Uh, these things are pretty sharp, um, taking it off and immediately using it, but it's pretty cool for the movies. In the Civil War, hand-to-hand -hand combat is quite rare. With the artillery, you're going to fight at a distance. And usually, when an enemy is you know, 10 yards from you, you're gonna try to run away. Um, so hand-to-hand -hand combat, it did happen, to be sure. Club muskets, bayonets, sabers, punching and kicking, but it's pretty rare to have it, let alone a straight up sort of uh, wrestling melee that's going on in the rain. It, it just, it struck me as a little bit much. I'm gonna rate this clip a four out of 10. I adore this movie, but the, the battle scene is pretty ridiculous. If I'm in an open field, I would be tickled pink to have half my body covered by some slats in a fence. I would prefer a big boulder, don't get me wrong, but I'm going to be happy for anything I can use that gives me more chance to live and gives my troops a better chance to repel the enemy. Once you've got the range of your weapon, they could be extraordinarily accurate, but hitting a moving target laterally is probably not easy for anybody except the best shooters. Certainly it's possible. Is it unlikely uh, you know, that he could make it through such a hailstorm of bullets? Yeah, it seems pretty unlikely to me. They could have hit him while he was resting. He was definitely within easy musket range at that point, but the Civil War produces hundreds of examples of that man is too brave, don't shoot him. So there was a gentlemanliness and an honor. Is this the last one? I don't know. There's no ether either. One of the greatest myths of the Civil War is that Civil War surgeons are sort of sawing through people's bones without any sort of painkiller and no preparation while they scream to their surgeries, only biting on a bullet or, or a stick or something like this. And it's just not true. Most of those amputations were conducted with the use of morphine or ether, a substantial painkiller that would allow surgeons to actually carefully prepare for the actual amputation by cutting away the muscle, leaving a skin flap, and then sawing through the bone with a, sh a saw so sharp that it wouldn't take that long. Amputation was the most common surgery employed during the Civil War for good reason. Surgeons of the time could not deal with the complexities of internal injuries on the torso, but you could turn a wound to your extremities into something they could treat by amputating it. At least there's no gangrene. Well, there will be if it doesn't come off soon. The dreaded infection, gangrene, for which the Civil War would start to produce a cure, actually. Medical advancements were made, you know, very often with great frequency during the Civil War. Um, but surgeons understood the idea of infection, but they didn't have an understanding of microbiology yet. I'll rate this clip a six out of 10. You ready, boys? Gettysburg has sort of emerged as the greatest battle of the Civil War, and we have a lot of good accounts about what happened on Little Round Top. The Little Round Top set in the movie is extraordinarily accurate. It, it lacked the larger boulders that are actually on the hill today, and the soldiers really didn't have time to build a stone wall until after the fighting. But other than that, the open woods and the slope were very close to what you could see today. Send out word to take uh, ammunition from the wounded. Make every round count. Go. Here they come again. Ammunition is heavy 
and both armies have a limited supply of it. If an enemy attacks you four, five, six times as the Confederates did on Little Round Top, the Union would be naturally running out of ammunition. There's no big reserve train of ammunition anywhere. They'd already looked in the uh, cartridge boxes of their dead and wounded comrades. They were at the absolute end at that point. And there were no troops on Little Round Top until just a few minutes before the actual fighting took place. No one had time to build the impressive stone walls. No one had time to really scout out the position and figure out who's gonna go where. It was one brigade, you know, sort of placing soldiers rather quickly before the Confederates attack. These huge armies end up meeting upon their flanks at Little Round Top with basically equal numbers. It's something they showed pretty well in the movie in terms of numbers. Hey, The Union had already repulsed five attacks and they saw the Southerners forming for one more. They were really out of options and in a desperate moment, their Colonel Chamberlain, you see him order the bayonet. We don't have bullets, so let's use the pointy spears on the front of our guns and charge down into them. Left wing, right wheel. Right wheel! Charge! They did a simple military maneuver that the movie spells out well. For us, the Union line, the 20th Maine Regiment, was sort of straight, but then when the Confederates came from this side, they sort of formed into almost a V at some point. As they wanted to fall upon the Confederates, they wanted to do this and then this. So in other words, the left wing of the regiment, this is my left, is going to do a wheel so that they come online with the rest of them, at which time the whole regiment would wheel down the hill into the enemy, and it worked. I would rate this clip a nine. Close it up. You see them sort of lighting the fuse and then putting sandbags up because they didn't want the explosion coming back their way. This actually happened, but one thing I really wish they could have included was that they lit the fuse and waited five, 10 minutes and nothing happened. And then they had to remove the sandbags and the bravest man in the world had to go into that shaft and find out where it had broken and splice it and light that thing again and run back out and it worked. The Union had made careful plans for this attack. And part of that plan is, of course, to get the, the Union soldiers as close to the coming crater as possible so that they're gonna cross the least amount of ground as possible before they were on top of the enemy. The ferocity of the blast ripping clothes off of people, uh, so many would have been just absolutely disintegrated you know, in the initial blast. I think it's something like 300 South Carolinians just gone. It's a turkey shoot! They run themselves to a hole! This idea of the turkey shoot, they've got themselves trapped in their own hole, is true, but not like you see it in the movie. First of all, the attack into the crater was part of a much larger attack with Union soldiers really exploiting some of their gains. Over the course of an hour or so, the Confederates are able to muster soldiers from another part of the battlefield that were able to come and then sort of push the Union soldiers back and shoot down upon those Union soldiers at the same time. So they weren't exactly surrounding the Union soldiers who were hapless inside the crater. Some were in there to be sure, but other soldiers are on both sides of the crater as well. This idea of using a gun as a spear at the right moment, absolutely documented during the Civil War. There's a real health concern about leaving man and beast rotting on the lines you're supposed to occupy. They showed a Confederate soldier grabbing a belt buckle um, off of a dead Union soldier because this is something that would happen regularly. One thing the Union had was more of almost everything the South needed, and that also went for textiles. So after a battle, either side would have rooted through um, the enemy dead or wounded. Others saw the need of the moment, like, I need to keep my pants up, and I need a new belt buckle. And I think that's what we're seeing there in that scene. I would give it a five. Some of it's so overdone. It's such a dramatic scene, but it's very effective outside of its accuracy. The blockade is sort of the unsung hero for the Union of the Civil War. They would blockade all the Southern ports, preventing them from getting the things they needed to wage the war. It took a while, but eventually the blockade worked and the South had real trouble 
getting things from Europe or from anywhere as the war went on, and they couldn't produce it all themselves. But that blockade wouldn't have been on the outskirts of Richmond, Virginia. These were on the North Atlantic Ocean and in the Gulf of Mexico, really blocking places like Wilmington, North Carolina and, uh, and Mobile, Alabama. But all those places had fallen by then anyway, so the blockade was almost a non-issue. The emergence of ironclad vessels changed the face of warfare forever. The days of the wooden ship were quickly ending after March of 1862 when iron ships started fighting against each other. This is something the clip did pretty well. It showed pretty accurately a Confederate ironclad vessel um, that would have had thick plates of iron in this fashion on the outside, and they correctly showed the way that it was designed to ricochet projectiles coming toward it. Artillery on a ship is often on a track so that it could handle the substantial recoil necessary from such a large charge of powder. But you would load it, tamp it down, and then move the gun back out through the well. Ironclad vessel had a good number of cannons, you know, sticking out of the ports. So you have a few vulnerabilities on the ship. I mean, if you hit that rudder, suddenly the ship can't steer anymore. Secondly, you have these ports where the guns stick out, which could be opened or closed as necessary. If you get a projectile in there, especially an exploding projectile, uh, you're going to do sub substantial damage inside the ship. Third, if you can hit the pilot house, you can't see from inside those ships except out of that pilot house. This battle is being fought in Richmond, Virginia, as Richmond is burning. The Confederate Army is fleeing at this point, and it's not till the next day and the day after that the Union really started occupying these areas and capturing the cities. The Union has just cannon after cannon and regiments of men on the shoreline ready to batter this Confederate cannon. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous, um, at least that close to Richmond, uh, that they would be set up for such an engagement. If anything, the Union controlled the rivers um, you know, further uh, downstream. So if anything, the Union would have had naval vessels going against them. I would rate this clip a four. I guess I would call this clip cool and a lot of fun, but not a whole lot of accurate history there. My favorite Civil War battle scene that I watched today was definitely glory. It barely edges out Gettysburg. Glory just has all the drama. You've got the attack, you've got the charge, you've got some historical accuracy. It's just so well done. And, it, and although I've seen it 50 times already, it was enjoyable to watch again. And if you enjoyed this, why not click above for another video?